My name is Vishnu Davina and I basically come from civil service background. I have long been associated by now uh, with IES mentoring and coaching programs. In fact, prior to my civil service stint, I had uh, also served as an assistant professor at a university. And uh, today I have brought a very special topic for you, particularly those who are appearing for civil service examination. Now, since the prelims is over and we are shortly going to have the mains examination. So, this topic is uh, going to be immensely beneficial to all those candidates who are going to appear for mains examination this year and who are also to appear for the civil service examination in forthcoming years. Now, the topic of the day is uh, seven great ideas about Indian economy. And uh, this is definitely a fantastic topic because as the thought of Indian economy comes to our mind, we get to have a lot of images. We get to have images both of prosperity and poverty about India. But what are these seven great ideas which are shaping Indian economy and preparing it for the future? So I'm going to discuss with you today these seven great ideas about Indian economy. My name is Vishwata Vinna and as I said, I basically come from civil service background. Uh, so friends, let us start right away. The Indian economy had a great beginning in the past. Now in the days of the past, Indian economy had seen, you know, various turbulent times. But when we started off, it was quite a robust economy at that time. India was one of the largest economies in the world. For most of the two and a half millennia, starting around the end of first millennium BC and ending around the beginning of the British rule in India. So it was one of the you know, strong economies in the world. And around 500 BC, the Mahajanpadas minted punch mark silver coins. The period was marked by intensive trade activity and urban development. By 300 BC, the Maurya Empire. The Mauryan Empire had united most of the Indian subcontinent except Tamilakam, uh, which was ruled by the three crowned kings that time, who were allies of Mauryas. And the resulting political unity and military security had allowed for a common economic system and enhanced trade and commerce which increased agricultural productivity and national prosperity in general at that time. So you see that India had had that time a well-knit political system under the Mauryas and that provided a solid bedrock for growth and productivity of Indian economy. Now consolidation led to prosperity and we see in the past how this consolidation happened just now I mentioned about the Mauryan Empire was followed by classical and early medieval kingdoms including the Cholas, the Pandyas, Cheras, Guptas, Western Gangas, Harsha, Palas, Rastakutas and Hoysala. The whole lot of dynasties that ruled over India, different parts of India at that time. The Indian subcontinent had the largest economy of any region in the world for most of the interval between the 1st century and 18th century. Now, this is remarkable that we have had very good foundations, very strong foundations and the Indian economy at that time, indeed, you know, was a very robust economy, as I said, uh, though it is to be noted that up until 1080, its GDP per capita was higher than subsistence level. That means the Indian economy was really a prosperous economy at that time and this prosperity was actually assisted by the political unity which prevailed right from the time of Mauryas. But later on, of course, uh, so many different kingdoms were there in different parts, but, uh, but still, still the GDP per capita was higher than the subsistence level. And India experienced per capita GDP growth in the high medieval era during the Gupta Empire and during the Delhi Sultanate in the North and Vijayanagar Empire in the South. But 
was not as productive as Ming China until the 16th century. By the late 17th century, most of the Indian subcontinent had been reunited under the Mughal Empire, which became the largest economy and manufacturing power in the world, producing about a quarter of global GDP before fragmenting and being conquered over in the next century. Now, that time, you know, again, there was a big chance of political unity under the Mughals. And that also, you know, that political unity led to a great prosperity for India. Bengal Suba, the empire's wealthiest province that solely accounted for 40% of Dutch imports outside the West, had an advanced productive agriculture, textile, manufacturing, and shipbuilding in a period of proto-industrialization. Now, you see, the economic impact of imperialism is important that before I discuss the first great idea about Indian economy, it is necessary that I am discussing some of the major events which had gone into the past because without understanding that, we will not be able to understand the present status and present condition of Indian economy. So, in order to understand those seven great ideas, the first thing which I am discussing with you right now is the background, the historical background. And in that, we have discussed the ancient and the medieval times, but in the modern times what happened was uh, imperialism and imperialism affected very badly our economy. In fact, our economy was drained out and devastated by British imperialism, which lasted for almost two centuries. And debate continues about the economic impact of the British imperialism in India. Uh, the issue was first raised by Edmund Burke, who in the 1780s vehemently attacked the East India Company, claiming that Warren Hastings and other top officials had ruined the Indian economy and society. And this concept was further elaborated on in the 19th century by Ramesh Chandra Datta, Indian historian Rajat Kantar Ray in 1998 continued this line of reasoning saying that British rule in the 18th century took the form of plunder and was a catastrophe for the traditional economy of India. Now, according to the economic drain theory, which was also partly propounded at that time by Dadabai Noraji in his book, Poverty and the Un-British Rule in India, supported by Ray, the British depleted food, money stocks and imposed high taxes that helped cause terrible famine of 1770, which killed a third of the people of Bengal. Ray also argued British India failed to offer the necessary encouragement, technology transfers and protectionist frameworks to permit British India to replicate Britain's own industrialization before its independence. So, we see that they followed, you know, uh, a policy of duplicity. They were practicing industrialization and those big economic ideas in Britain, while India, they popularized India by just making it a source of raw materials and a big marketplace for their manufactured goods from Leeds and Manchester. So, our economic uh, our economy that time was devastated by British colonialism. Other economic historians have blamed the colonial rule for the current dismal state of India's economy with investment in Indian industries limited since it was a colony. Under British rule, India, India's um, number of native manufacturing industries also shrank drastically. The economic policies of the British Raj caused a severe decline in the handicrafts and handloom sectors, which reduced demand and dipping, dipped the employment drastically. The yarn output of the handloom industry for that matter, for example, declined from 419 million pounds in 1850 to 240 million pounds in 1900. Now we can see that the, the artisans, that the local industries of India, they were rather completely, you know, if not uprooted, you know, largely devastated during that time. During the British East India Company's rule in India, production of food crops declined, mass impoverishment and destitution of farmers, and numerous famines. The result was a significant transfer of capital from India to England, which led to a massive drain of revenue rather than any systematic effort at modernization of Indian economy. So, friends, what I am saying that, you know, that is the background of Indian economy. And under that background, we have to understand one more fact. Now, this is the fact, there is no doubt that our grievances against the British Empire 
at a sound basis as the painstaking statistical work of the Cambridge historian Angus Madison has shown India's share of world e income collapsed from 22.6 percent. Look here, the, the India's share of world income collapsed from 22.6 percent in 1700, almost equal to Europe's share of 23.3 percent. Put together, the entire Europe share in the world income was 23.3 percent. And in 1700, India's share in the world income was 22.6 percent. And this has been supported by none other than Angus Madison, the Cambridge historian. At a time, at the time, to a low as 3.8 percent, it had come down to 3.8 percent in 1952. Indeed, at the beginning of the 20th century, the brightest jewel in the British crown was the poorest country in the world which got reflected in terms of a highly declined per capita income. So we find that a robust and prosperous economy had been pauperized and drained out and it had been, it had been turned into a weak economy, a devastated economy. And as a result of uh, exploitation caused by British colonialism, India had reached almost the nadir of its economic development at that time. There was hardly any economic development worth mentioning. Of course, they did some work, but as the statistics would show that India was completely pauperized under the British rule. Now, the first great idea about Indian economy, which I'm going to discuss with you, is but in spite of the devastating and exploitative impact of the colonialism, and also due to the negative impact of corona pandemic recently we have had in the recent past, Indian economy has shown a great resilience by turning around in a big way from a suppressed economy to a much talked about growing and a gigantic economy in the world today. So that is the first remarkable feature of Indian economy. It has tremendous resilience. And this resilience, it has shown time and again throughout the history of Indian economy. If we see great resilience Indian economy has shown and time and again, as I say. Now, we have had the corona pandemic, but economy has come out of it successfully and it's a big turnaround. I will show you the data. There's a big turnaround in the economy and our economy now today in GDP nominal terms is the sixth largest economy in the world. In PPP, that is purchasing power parity terms, it is the third largest economy in the world. So, how this massive turnaround has happened and what are those great ideas about Indian economy which have really resulted in this great prosperity for India and which is going to bring about much larger and unimaginable prosperity for India in days and years to come. Now, students, uh, friends, uh, it is said that the only way to describe the future is to shape it. Uh, it is now well recognized that on an average in recent years, India has registered the fastest growth among all the major democracies in the world. India is currently one of the fastest growing economies of the world. Look at the current figures. The Indian economy expanded at a record 20.1% year on year in second quarter of 2021, slightly higher than the market forecast of 20% amid a low base effect from last year and despite a second wave of COVID-19 infections and localized lockdowns. So you see this massive turnaround is seen in these statistics that it has shown a 20.1% YOY year on year, quarter, quarter and second quarter ending 2021 growth rate, which is, which is laudable, commendable by all means. Now, it compares with the record 24.4% slump a year earlier when the coronavirus crisis hit the economy's heart. In second quarter of 2021, the construction sector surged 68.3%, manufacturing jumped 49.6%, trade, hotels, transport and communications 34.3%, mining 18.6%, utilities 14.3%, the farm sector 4.5% and the financial and real estate sector 3.7%. On the consumption side, private expenditure is increased 19.3%, investment by 55.3%, exports by 39.1%, and imports by 60.2%.
while public expenditure dropped a bit by 4.8%. So we can see the massive turnaround data that Indian economy is surging and despite, you know, all the background which we have had depressive background of colonial exploitation, economy now increasingly in modern times is moving forward and despite, despite the fact that corona pandemic has indeed dealt a severe blow to the economies the world over, Indian economy is one shining jewel on the horizon of world economy which is showing marvelous results and very big turnaround. Now, it represents the third largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity today. And the past, present, and future of India represents the story of how the slow growing economy of around 3.9% growth in the first 40 years of independence has steadily grown from strength to strength to have acquired the status of being the sixth largest economy in the world today in terms of its nominal GDP. Now, this is, this is indeed a marvelous achievement. As I said, the first great idea is about the resilience of Indian economy. It is so resilient, it has its own fundamental forces which enable it to bounce back to a high point and bounce back from poverty to prosperity. Now, have a look at some latest data. What it says, India's population approximated now 139.5 crores GDP approximated to 3.05 trillion dollars at nominal uh, prices, 10.21 trillion dollars at purchasing power parity, 2021 estimates GDP ranks sixth in the on, based on nominal GDP 2021, third based on purchasing power parity 2021, GDP growth increased 20.1%. And of course, we have had, you know, a massive and bumper turnaround. It is estimated that the incoming years, Brazil, Russia, India and China, the BRIC economies could become the much larger force in the world economy. And India would emerge as the world's third largest economy over the next decade or so. Now, economists the world over agree that India not only is a great market, but has, has those fundamental economic forces which will enable it to come forward to its uh, from sixth rank today in terms of nominal GDP to third position in the world economic uh, scene uh, within a decade or so. Now, not that even in the, uh, in the first phase of 50 years, there were no gains. Growth was slow. I'm talking of after independence. Growth was slow due to adoption of semi-socialist development model with excessive economic control and inadequacy of physical and social infrastructure. Nonetheless, important gains were achieved by securing food security through green revolution, building up a capital intensive industries, launching a dairy revolution, managing the severe foreign exchange shortages and setting up world acclaimed centers of educational excellence like IITs and IIMs, which today give us a vantage position in the race of global competitiveness. In the decade of 90s, having achieved that average 5.5% growth rate per capita income, rising at close to 4%, the period also marks the progressive deregulation of Indian economy, cutting across all sectors and segments. I'm talking about 90s, we had, you know, a massive turnaround because what is known as privatization, liberalization and globalization, that was the key word that time and that now we have had, you know, a severe uh, a balance of trade, balance of payment crisis that time. Balance of payment crisis means we had hardly any foreign reserves to, you know, meet our obligations. At that time, that time these massive reforms were brought about and they are continuing even till date. Now, but what is the future? Now, is the GDP growth rate expected in the current fiscal just a flash in the pan or is sustainable? Is the current Indian economic upswing powerful enough for a sustained growth to last long enough? Or will it be a long Indian growth story? Or will it subside in the short run? The answers to all these questions lie in understanding these seven great ideas and features associated with Indian economy that I'm presenting to you in this video today. So students, the first, the, the high growth levels achieved during the 90s, which will reach a high point just by the past standards in the coming years and will be sustained by some critical drivers, which are the other great economic ideas in our today's talk. So before I proceed further to the second great idea, I just want to acquaint you with an academy a little. 
that an academy today is, a, is the most happening place in the field of education. I'm a working professor with an academy, a faculty with an academy. And uh, very recently, we have had civil service examination results where we have had, you know, you know, large number of toppers from an academy, like uh, almost 170 plus results, you know, an academy toppers. They, they come from, you know, uh, different, uh, different parts of the country. And we have had, you know, rankers in top, top 50, all Apala Mishra, Jagriti Avasthi, and Satyam Gandhi, and Gaurav Budhania, and Karishma Nair, Arth Jain, and all these, you know, great luminaries. Now they got uh, into civil service, seven rankers in top 20, 15 in top 50, 170 plus in, you know, in, in all. We have got uh, the selections uh, carried through in civil service. Now, of course, uh, you know, a whole lot of value offerings are there in the packages if you subscribe to an academy packages, right? It's basically now you look at it now, All India Rank 13, Gaurav Gudhania has also been a student of an academy. And uh, he is, of course, uh, and now you can also watch him on YouTube and uh, you can also rather connect to him for essay and strategy classes. Now, what I'm saying is that uh, there's a great, uh, you know, uh, offerings, great offerings from an academy in terms of uh, major discounts being offered for optionals 28%. And if you use my referral code, my referral code is uh, VN10, victory like never before with the force of 10. That is, this is my referral code. If you use the referral code, you will, of course, be entitled for 10% additional discount. And, uh, of course, subscriptions are available for as low as 45,000 bucks. That is just an introductory offer, which would last till 31st of October. And a whole lot of discounts are there with Iconic and uh, other courses that you can avail of till 31st of October. A whole lot of discounts are available. Plus, of course, the test series worth 45,000 rupees you get for free on all offers with one year plus subscription, but this offer is also for a limited time till 22nd of this month. Then of course you get to have a three month festive combo for as low as you know, around 25, 28,000 bucks only. And this offer is also up to 22nd October. We are starting new batches for UPSC 2021, 22 and 23, all from 27th October. A whole lot of top educators, including my friend Sachin and Pavan, and a uh, whole lot of you know, Rajinish, they will all be there to help you out in optional subjects. You should rather, this is high time for you to chip in and uh, subscribe to an academy. We are uh, shortly going to start. You can also get connected to me at any time. Right, UPSC, civil service batches, all that, you know, 2023 batches, 21 batches. We are all starting 27th October, new batches. And, you know, throughout the journey, an academy will support you as you mature through your preparations, we'll make sure that uh, no stone is kept unturned and you get to have the best of coaching and best of education possible in India. And of course, comprehensive bilingual batches also for 2022, we are starting 27th October. And you see this whole journey I just now spoken about that right starting with the beginner's course of, uh, you know, with NCRE books to the advanced level and interview preparations. Now at all stages, uh, an academy will give you full support. This comprehensive courses again, I said 2023 courses, English and bilingual courses we are starting 27th October for a whole lot of subjects we are starting these. Now, this Anacademy um, uh, no, discounts, of course, now 24th October, 11 a.m. This uh, uh, combat, mega combat is there. You can participate in this and entitle yourself for you know, a whole lot of scholarships. Here, I tell you that you use my code VN10 that is victory like never before uh, with a force of 10, right? And uh, you, you will be entitled for, you know, uh, entry into this mega, mega combat. And also you'll be entitled for a whole lot of other benefits uh, if you use this referral code VN10. So live mentoring platform is there. You can get connected to, you know, mentors and teachers and professors live for clearance of your doubts uh, through the course of your uh, preparation and journey for your preparation for civil service or for any other you know competitive exams so this is high time you can chase your dream 
and you can also avail of 0% interest rate loan from an academy online with no hidden charges it's available so friends let's crack it and let's join an academy let's uh, continue with our you know second thought that I gave you the first idea the first great idea now the second great idea we are slowly moving on to the second great idea but India on the other hand has got the highest number of people in the younger age group the labor force constitutes 78.7 percent of the working age 15 to 64 population and 39.1 percent of the total population the percentage of working force to the working age population is high compared to other countries particularly among males so more than 930 million people out of 1.4 billion people are young and young population will continue till 2050 so in 2020 about 26.16 percent of india's population fell into 0 to 14 year category 67.27 percent in 15 to 64 age group and 6.57 percent were 65 years and above of age so india is therefore has got one of the youngest populations in an aging world and the median age in india is around just 28 compared to 37 in china and and 30 compared to 37 in china and uh, and the us 45 in western europe and 49 in japan so according to united nations population fund demographic dividend means uh, the economic growth potential that can result from shifts in a population's age structure mainly when the share of the working age population is larger than the non-working age share of the population so india's uh, this uh, favorable so india has got a favorably high number of people in the working age group while many oecd countries and other developed countries are facing and are likely to continue face workforce shortages for quite some time in the foreseeable future so the second great idea the second great idea is that india second great idea about the indian economy is therefore the demographic dividend demographic dividend if you look at the global demographic trends it is obvious that the median age of population in the oecd countries is rising rapidly now not the, notwithstanding the gains of productivity or more favorably more favorable immigration policy but um, both productivity and growth will be hurt unless there is continued outsourcing of economic activity elsewhere where skilled young men power is available in abundance so to say that the second great idea about indian economy is its a uh, demographic dividend demographic dividend which I know just now explained to you that how you know, many of these countries, developed countries, are facing you know uh, the the youth dearth, whereas India is passing through the youth bulge. Youth bulge basically means that we are going to have the largest number of people in the working age group above 15 and below 65, and that is a great advantage for Indian economy. And this advantage is likely to continue for Indian economy for decades to come. Estimates show that at least till 2050, Indian economy will have out of proportion this young population and therefore, you know, big, big labor force and uh, skilled manpower. But of course, we have to skill them up at the same time. And already for that, a, a massive national program is underway. So what I'm saying that uh, India has got a favorably high number of people in the working age group while the OECD and countries and the other developed countries are facing and are likely to continue to face workforce shortages. As I said, the youth dirt they are likely to face, whereas we are having the youth bulge for quite some time in the foreseeable future. Estimates, as I said, they show that till 2050, India is going to you know, now have this great benefit of demographic dividend. But we must not forget that the realization of this opportunity of a favorable demographic bulge or youth bulge, we call that, will involve inculcation of skills, strengthening the fabric of the educational system and major reforms in the area of human resource development. These three key areas we have to touch upon in order to exploit the, the, the benefits of uh, this youth bulge which India is, India is having. Now, that is the second great idea that uh, India is now having this, uh, this great opportunity. And of course, of course, under the present government, India is uh, doing a marvelous job. And the present government, I should rather now uh, 
praise the present government to the extent possible because they've done a marvelous job in bringing about, in turning, turning around the economy and in bringing about great prosperity for almost all sections of society. Of course, there are problems. I don't say that I mean, problems are not there. There are challenges and there are problems, but, but from the side of the government, probably this is the first government ever in the history of India, which has shown so marvelous results in such a short time and which con continues to shine and outshine other governments. So what I'm saying, of course, I will show you some of the major programs launched by this government, which, which are remarkable programs and which are going to be immensely helpful for the, for the health of the economy, for the prosperity of the people, and, and in bringing about a great name and fame to India in the committee of nations in the world. Now, the third great idea, which I'm going to talk to you today, is the conjunction dividend of India. Now, I just not talked about the, the demographic dividend, the second great idea, right? The third great idea is the consumption dividend. Now, what is this consumption dividend? The consequential demographic profile gives the benefit not merely of a young working age group, but also a larger growing market. Now, past international experience suggests that this will not only yield a higher savings rate, but also result in increased consumer spending. National savings rate in East Asia showed a significant increase to, to you know, were 30% driven by their increase in working age population and India's savings rate is expected to move in the same direction upwards and this will result in a significant increase in overall consumption even at a 6% compounded annual you know conservative growth rate based on PPP the size of the market would rise tremendously and at the projected growth rate of more than 9% this would be significantly higher so looking at from another point of view level of affluence is steadily increasing in India and even between 1995 and 2002 for example nearly 100 million people became part of consuming and rich classes and this process has since been continuing with a larger momentum with some breaks as was seen in the disruption caused due to corona induced pandemic and hysteria during 2021 but in all likelihood over the next 10 years this growth is likely to be dramatic because a large number of people will be moving into consuming and very rich classes. Number of rich people is increasing because prosperity is increasing as I have now demonstrated here that even with the conservative growth rate estimates, which we are you know, uh, estimating minimum 6% and going around average 9%, it would be significantly higher rather. And number of people joining the, the brackets of the rich is going to be, you know, on a much higher side in India. Now, this is great news and great tidings for the country's economy. The fourth great idea, the fourth great idea is that the economic growth process is getting more inclusive with the passage of time. On an average, 40 to 50 million people are joining the middle classes every year, representing a huge consumption spending in terms of the demand. Demand for, you know, cell phones or televisions or scooters or motor cars or credit goods and the basket of consumption pattern associated with rising of income. So this growth in consumption would be further boosted by several fiscal incentives and reform measures, including the MSME sector reforms carried out by the government of India recently and the new phenomenon of easy availability of affordable consumer financing from the Indian banking system. So this whole lot of uh, you know, favorable factors are going to boost the economy in a big way and uh, and the growth process is going to be more inclusive than ever before. The disbursements in the Indian retail financial services market more than doubled over the last three years. And reckon this in conjunction with the increased propensity of a rural population, showing increasing preference for articles of mass consumption like televisions, electric equipments, and generally the white and brown goods. In fact, the statistics reveal that the share of consumption expenditure of rural India on food items has decreased over the last 30 years, while the consumption spent on known food items has increased or gone up in the same time. So what I'm saying is that there is a massive spending on known food item which shows that people are, the income of the people is rising and prosperity with the people is increasing. Now the fifth great idea which I'm going to talk to you about Indian economy today is the fifth great idea about Indian economy 
is the idea is concerned with the great momentum in growth with more of emphasis on inclusive growth and the prospect of a rising growth profile in coming years. Now, India has emerged with the fastest growing major economy in the world and is expected to be one of the top three economic powers in the world over the next 10 to 15 years, now, backed by its robust democracy and strong partnerships. So there's no doubt that in coming decade or more than, de more than a decade or so, in 10 to 15 years, India is going to be in the top category income, in top income category countries. That is, it is going to occupy a place at least third rank, third rank. Now, after the economies of US and China, it is going to occupy at least the third rank in the world. Now, what I'm saying, just have a look at the market size. For example, India's gross domestic product GDP at the current prices is stood at rupees 51.23 lakh crores. That amounts to 694.93 billion United States dollars in the first quarter of financial year 2022 itself. As per the provisional estimates of the gross domestic product for the first quarter of 2022, India is the fourth largest unicorn base in the world. Fourth largest unicorn base in the world with over 21 unicorns collectively valued at US 73.2 billion as per the Durham Global Unicorn List. By 2025, India is expected to have more than 100 unicorns by 2025 and will create 1.1 million direct jobs according to the NASCOM Genov Report Indian Tech Startup. So, so it's the fourth largest unicorn base in the world. What is a unicorn? Of course, unicorn, you understand, is a venture capital industry. The term unicorn refers to any startup that reaches the valuation of $1 billion. And this term was first coined by Eileen Lee, a U.S. angel investor, founder of Cowboy, Cowboy Ventures, when she referred to 39 startups that had a valuation of over $1 billion as unicorns. The term initially was used to lay emphasis on the rarity of such startups. The definition of a unicorn startup has remained unchanged since then. However, the number of unicorns is steadily rising. Now, the great growth prospects exist with increased rate of employment. So, India needs to increase its rate of employment growth and create 90 million known farm jobs between 23 and 30s for productivity and economic growth, according to McKenzie Global Institute. So the net employment rate needs to grow up to 1.5% per year, right? From 2023 to 2030 to achieve 8 to 8.5% GDP growth between 23 and 30, that is 2023 and 2030. Now talk about the great forex reserves of India. According to data from the Department of Economic Affairs, as of August 27, 2021, Foreign exchange reserves in India reached uh, you know, $633.5 billion mark, a whopping amount of $633.5 billion mark. So the recent developments indicative of a great growth momentum with, uh, with an uh, improvement in the economic scenario, there have been investments across various sectors in the economy, the private equity, venture capital, the EVC sector recorded investments worth US $10.7 billion across 137 deals in August 21 itself, registering a five times year-on-year -year growth. Now, some of the important recent developments in Indian economy, they are enlisted here. For example, the first one I am talking about, the growth, the great idea of growth and how is it happening, how the magic of growth is happening and how this turnaround is taking place under the aegis of a great leadership in the present time. Now, India's mer merchandise exports between April 2021 and August 2021 were estimated at US 164.1 billion US dollar, 67.33% year on year increase. On that, merchandise imports between April 2021 and August 2021 were estimated at 219.6 billion US dollar, almost 80.89% YOY growth. Now, in August 2021, for example, the Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, PMI, in India stood at 52.3. The gross GST, Goods and Services Tax Revenue Collection, stood at Rs. 1,12,000 crores plus in August 2021. Whopping amount. Now, according to the Department of Promotion of Industry and Internal Trade, DPIIT, 
FDI equity inflow in India stood at US $547.2 billion between April 2000 and June 2021. Now, India's Index of Industrial Production IIP for July 2021 stood at 131.4 against 122.6 for June 2021. Now you see this, these are all signs of a tremendous turnaround, tremendous growth and this growth is going to be sustained growth for quite some time. Now, consumer food price index combined inflation was 3.11 in August 21 as against 3.96 in July 21. You see, there also there is a fall in inflation. Consumer price index CPI combined inflation was 5.30 in August 21 as against 5.59 in July 21. Foreign portfolio investors invested almost two and a half billion US dollars in India in August 2021. I'm giving you the latest, latest data to show that how this growth has become so robust and it is taking place so magically that India is certainly, certainly going to be a leading, leading, big, big economy of the world in a very short time. My prediction is within 10 years time, India will surpass most of the economies of the world and reach an astounding level, maybe possibly, you know, even more than... Uh, 12 to 20 trillion dollars. Now, great government initiatives launched to take economy to great heights. Now, I will talk about these great government initiatives in order to demonstrate that how this great idea of growth is being fueled and how economic turnaround is taking place because this is necessary for us to understand, particularly when we are preparing for IAS examination in depth to understand that what are these seven great ideas which really make the foundation of Indian economy and stake the Indian economy to the forefront on the horizons of world economies. And in that direction, the great government initiatives which have been launched to take the economy to great heights must be understood in that context. I'm going to discuss this. Now, the first thing, the first union budget of the third decade, 21st century, was presented by the Minister of Finance and Corporate Affairs, Ms. Uh, Nirmala Sitaraman, in the parliament on 1st of February, 2020. The budget aimed at energizing the Indian economy through a combination of short-term, medium-term and long-term measures. Now, in the union budget, 21-22, capital expenditure for financial year 22 is likely to increase now by 34.5% at 5.5 lakh crore, right? Then increased government expenditure is expected to attract private investments with production-linked incentive schemes providing excellent opportunities. Consistently proactive, graded and measured policy support is anticipated to boost the Indian economy. In September 21, Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi approved the production-linked incentive scheme in the textile sector now for man-made fiber, apparel, MMF, fabrics and 10 segments products or products of technical textiles at an estimated outlay of 10,683 crores. In September 21, the government approved the production-linked incentive scheme for automobile and drone industries with an outlay of 26,000 crores to boost the country's manufacturing capabilities. In September 2021, Union Cabinet approved major reforms in telecom sector, which is expected to boost employment, growth, com competition and consumer interest. Now, key reforms include rationalization of adjusted gross revenue, rationalization of bank guarantees and encouragement of spectrum sharing. Now, in September 2021, for example, the government announced plans to release more than 56,000 crores under various export promotion schemes to boost exports. In August 2021, the Indian government approved deep ocean mission with a budget outlay of more than 4,000 crores over the next five years. Then in May 2021, the government approved the production-linked incentive scheme for manufacturing advanced chemistry cell batteries at an estimated outlay of more than 18,000 crores. Now, this move is expected to attract domestic and foreign investment worth of 45,000 crores in this sector. The union cabinet approved the production-linked incentive scheme for white goods, that is air conditioners and LED lights, with a budgetary outlay of more than 6,000 crores and the National Programme on High Efficiency Solar Photovoltaic Cells Modules with an outlay of more than 4,000 crores. So, now similarly, you can see that in June 21, 
The RBI, Reserve Bank of India, announced that the investment limit of FPI, the foreign portfolio investors in the state development loans and the government securities, GSEC, would persist unaffected at 2% and 6% respectively for the financial year 22. And to boost the overall audit quality, transparency and add value to the businesses, in April 2021, the RBI issued a notice on new norms to appoint statutory and central auditors for commercial banks, large urban cooperative and large non-banks, non-banking institutions and housing finance firms. Now, in May 2021, the Government of India has allocated more than 2,000 crores for development of the horticulture sector in 2021. You see, the whole lot of schemes, you know, productivity linked incentives and whole lot of schemes and whole lot of expenditure programs. Now that is really putting the economy on a path of, uh, you know, accelerated growth, I would rather say. In November 2020, for example, the government of India announced 2.65 lakh crores stimulus package to generate job opportunities and provide liquidity support to various sectors such as tourism, aviation, construction and housing. Also, India's cabinet approved the production-linked incentives scheme to provide 2 trillion rupees worth of over five years to create jobs and boost production in the country. All this is going to do magic for the economy in days to come. Now, here, I've talked about this, i talked about this. Ah, yeah. So here, numerous foreign companies, numerous foreign companies are setting up their facilities in India on account of various government initiatives like Make in India and Digital India. Mr. Narendra Modi, the Prime Minister of India, launched Make in India initiative with an aim to boost country's manufacturing sector and increase purchasing power of an average Indian consumer, which would further drive demand and spur development, thus benefiting investors. The Government of India under its Make in India initiative is trying to boost the contribution made by the manufacturing sector with an aim to take it to 25% of GDP from the current 17%. Now, that will be a great jump. Now, besides, the government has also come up with Digital India initiative, I know just no mention about it, which focuses on three core components. One, creation of digital infrastructure. Two, delivering services digitally and three, increasing digital literacy in the country. Then, some of the recent initiatives and developments undertaken by the government also includes, for example, in, uh, on November 1, 2021, India and United Kingdom hope to begin negotiations on a free trade agreement. The proposal, FTA, between these two countries is likely to unlock business opportunities and generate jobs. Now, both sides have renewed their commitment to boost trade in a manner that benefits all. In August 2021, Niti Aayog and Cisco collaborated to encourage women's entrepreneurship in India. In August 2021, Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi announced an initiative to start a national mission to reach the US $400 billion merchandise export target by financial year 2022. Now, same way we can see that in August 21, the Prime Minister Mr. Modi launched digital payment solution. E-Rupi, E-R-U-P-I, a contactless and cashless instrument for digital payments. I'm highlighting these schemes because these schemes you need to know in order to understand the economy. That you know in what all directions, what all things are being done and unless we are acquainted with all these directions, it will not be possible for us to actually have, an, you know, have a complete and holistic idea about Indian economy. So he, look here, look here. The digital payment solution, ERUPI, contactless and cashless instrument for digital payments is there. And in June 21, RBI Governor Mr. Shantikanta Das, uh, sorry, Mr. Shaktikanta Das announced the policy repo rate unchanged at 4% and he also announced various measures including rupees 15,000 crore worth of liquidity support to contact intensive sectors such as tourism and hospitality. In June 2021, Finance ministers of G7 countries, including the United States, UK, Japan, Italy, Germany, France, and Canada, attained a historic contract on taxing multinational firms, as per which the minimum global tax rate would be at least 15%. And this move is expected to benefit India to increase foreign direct investment in the country. Right. This is indirectly going to benefit India in that sense. In June 2021, the Indian government signed 
$32 million worth of US, uh, US dollar worth of loan with World Bank for improving healthcare services in Mizoram alone. For example, in May 2021, Government of India and European Investment Bank signed the finance contract for second tranche of Euro 150 million for Pune Metro Rail project. Now, according to an official source, as of September 15, 2021, 52 companies have filed applications under Rs 5,866 crore production-linked incentive scheme for the white goods sector. That includes air conditioners and LED lights. So, so friends, now, uh, again, you know, some of these I'm bringing, bringing here for you in May 2021. The Union Cabinet has also approved signing of Memorandum of Understanding on Migration and Mobility Partnership between Government of India, the United Kingdom, and the Great Britain and, and Northern Ireland. Now, in April 2021, Minister of Railways and Commerce and Industry and Consumer Affairs, Mr. Piyush Goyal, launched DFGT, Trade Facilitation App, that is Director General of Foreign Trade App, to provide instant access to exports and exporters and importers anytime and anywhere. Now, these are all measures by the government which are helping in a big way in taking the economy forward. And I'm just trying to highlight, you know, some of the major areas which are, which are taking the economy to great heights and what initiatives are being taken and why we should know about these initiatives because unless we know about these initiatives those areas we will be blank about we will not have any hang any idea about that so it is necessary now for example here april 2021 dr ahmed abdul rahman al banna ambassador of the uae to india and founding pattern of ifiicc now international federation of indo israel chambers of commerce it stated that trilateral trade between India and UAE and Israel is expected to reach $110 billion by 2030, a whopping amount. So you see what all, what all agreements are happening, what all treaties are being signed, and what all efforts are being made on all fronts. And now why the economy is showing great signs of resilience and growth is because there is a multi-pronged approach to take the economy to new heights in a very calibrated and well thought out and orchestrated manner. And all the ministries and all the sectors are contributing to that. And Indian people at large are also contributing to that. Now, India is expected to attract investment of around US $100 billion in developing the oil and gas infrastructure during 19 to 23 period. And the government of India is going to increase public health spending to 2.5% of the GDP by 2025. Now, after Corona crisis, this is one of the major areas where government is now intending and contemplating to spend 2.5% of GDP for implementation of agricultural export policy. Government has approved an outlay of more than 2,000 billion rupees for 2019, aimed at doubling farmers' income by 2022. So, the saga of great growth for Indian economy to continue as can be seen in the roadmap that lies ahead. Now, what is the roadmap that lies ahead? That briefly, I will just catalog for you as per the data published in, depart, uh, in a Department of Economic Affairs report. In the first quarter of financial year 2022, India's output recorded a 20.1% year-on-year growth. I have just now given you that figure earlier also. Recovering more than 90% of the pre-pandemic output in the first quarter of financial year 20. Now, India's real gross, gross value added. Now, this is correlated to you know, the gross value added correlated to GDP, but of course, uh, after taking the deflector into, def, def, deflator into account. Also recorded an 18.8% of year-on-year -year increase in the first quarter of financial year 22, posting a recovery of more than 92% of its corresponding pre-pandemic level. Right. The growth in the economic recovery is due to the government's continued efforts to accelerate vaccination coverage also among the citizens and also provide an optimistic outlook for further revival of industrial activities. So, so now as per RBI's revised estimates of July 21, the real GDP growth of the country is estimated at 21.4% for the first quarter of financial year 22. The increase in the tax collection along with government's budget support to states strengthened the overall growth of the Indian economy. The India is focusing on renewable sources to generate energy and it is planning to achieve 40% of its energy from non-fossil sources by 2030, which is currently 30%, and have plans to increase its renewable energy capacity from 175 gigawatt 
by 2022. In line with this, in May 2021, India along with UK jointly launched a roadmap 2030 to collaborate and combat climate change by 2030. Now, this is a great step taken by India and of course, a may, big, big achievements have been made in that direction in the climate change by the present government. A lot of initiatives have been taken and India is expected to be the third largest consumer economy as its consumption may triple to 4 trillion US dollar by 2025 owing to shift in consumer behavior and expenditure pattern according to Boston uh, Consulting Group report. Now, it is estimated to surpass USA to become the second largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity by 2040 as per the report by Pricewatch, Pricewaterhouse Coopers. Pricewaterhouse Coopers. So here, now again, it's a great prediction for India that it is estimated to surpass USA to become the second largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity by 2040. Now, demand is also rising in the rural India that I have already demonstrated that with the increased telephonic connectivity extending to rural India at a rapid rate and other programs to build dependable around the year, rural roads, rural India will be mainstreamed with the rest of the economy, the side of the growing market itself, even on the modest growth consumption is staggering because uh, we would nearly be adding one France in three and a half years and one Australia every year. So the demographic dividend and the consumption dividend will together synergize to become two critical drivers of change and sustained growth in years to come. So friends, the sixth great idea now I'm going to talk about is the sixth great idea is the knowledge dividend that India possesses. What is this knowledge dividend? Now it is it is no secret that India has rapidly become the service capital of the world based on comparative factor advantage and its ability to move up the value added chain. The Indian pharmaceutical sector has achieved global recognition for production of low cost, high quality generic drugs and branded medicines. Now, on, on a, of all the software firms which have achieved level five of capability maturing model, more than 55% are Indian firms combined this with a comparative cost advantage where the information technology engineer in USA would cost more than $75,000 compared to a more of $7,500 in India. And an MBA would cost in USA around $95,000 and that would be available in India for just $9,000. So reckon this with the movement of the value chain while India has already established itself in areas like transaction processing it is now rapidly moving up the value chain and achieving comparative advantage in areas like design and analysis, research and development, covering numerous industries including information technology, pharmaceuticals, educational services, auto engineering, chemicals and financial services. And in addition, India also uh, is competitive for services being offered to customers when they come to India either for health treatment, for value-added tourism or leisure tourism. On a minimum estimate, the impact of India becoming the service center of the world contribute enormously to its GDP and also in terms of employment generation, both direct and indirect. So India's knowledge capital has also facilitated a resurgence of the manufacturing sector, exemplified by exports, nearly tripling over the last decade and India emerging as the global manufacturing destination of leading multinational corporations in the areas of auto components, pharmaceuticals, agri-products, etc. Leveraging this strength coupled with a global mindset, both service and manufacturing sector companies have catapulted themselves into global arena. Now, the fourth, the productivity dividend that we just now talked about, the notwithstanding high rates of growth registered in 1990s, the new growth trajectory which is beginning to unfold productivity continues to be, of course, low in India as compared to other major economies, while productivity has been rising significantly over the past 10 years. There's a huge room to improve it rapidly. Further, even the modest investment of capital will lead to significant increase in productivity given technological improvements and the favorable incremental capital output ratio. So this increase in productivity, modest investment will have a significant and sustainable impact in the long run uh, for the long-term growth rate of Indian economy. Now, this will also raise significantly India's share in global trade, which has so far been just around 1.67% of exports to global merchandise, exports and in services, which is 3.54% share as of now, both productivity gains and trade gains looking at the current modest levels have a huge room to grow even with modest changes and this will have a multiplier effect on the GDP growth rate. So as we've seen that this uh, 
this uh, great uh, idea, uh, this great idea is that of the knowledge dividend and how this knowledge dividend will drive India to a key position in the, in the, inter in the, in the world as far as uh, international economies are concerned. Now friends, the seventh great idea I am going to talk to you about Indian economy. The seventh great idea, now the government of India has, it is about the Indian missions basically. Uh, the Indian, Indian government has initiated, you know, several national missions in order to achieve individual goals and together uh, to ensure the well-being of its citizens. Now the government of India has initiated these national missions uh, in order to achieve the well-being of citizens and uh, now let us first of all talk, on, talk about the mission on national initiative on climate resilient agriculture. Now national initiative on climate resilient agriculture was launched during February 2011 by Indian Council of Agriculture Research ICAR with the funding from Ministry of Agriculture, Government of India. The mega project has three major objectives of strategic research, technology demonstrations and capacity building across all sectors of agriculture, dairy and fisheries. Then Mission Milk is there, the first phase of national dairy plan. Mission Milk was set about in April 2012 at National Dairy Development Board and the first phase with an outlay of more than 2000 crore is part of an ambitious 15 year long national dairy plan with an estimated project cost of more than 17,000 crores. Then Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan. Now the Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, the Education for All movement is a program which is aimed at universalization of elementary education and in a time bound manner as mandated by the 86th Amendment Act of the Constitution of India, making free and compulsory education to children in 16 to 14 age group estimated to 2.5 million in number in 2001, I mean, of course, this number has tremendously gone up now. It's a fundamental right. Then, National Translation Mission. National Translation Mission is a government of India initiative to make knowledge text accessible in all Indian languages listed in the eighth schedule of constitution through translation. National Translation Mission was set up as per National Knowledge Commission's recommendation. The Ministry of Human Resource Development, which is now called the Education Ministry, as designated Capital Institute of uh, Central Institute of Indian Languages as the nodal organization for operationalization of National Translation Mission. Now, National Mission for Manuscripts, uh, another great mission, National Mission for Manuscripts, is an autonomous organization under Ministry of Culture, Government of India, established to survey, locate, and conserve Indian manuscripts with an aim to create national resources base for manuscripts for enhancing their access, awareness, and use of educational purposes. And then I'm going to talk about the National Action Plan on Climate Change, identified measures that promote our development objectives while also yielding you know, co-benefits for addressing climate change effectively. It outlines a number of steps to simultaneously advance India's development and climate change related objectives of adaptation and mitigation. It set up eight national missions in that direction for India's sustainable development. And the first one in that direction is the National Solar Mission. The National Action Plan on Climate Change aims to promote the development and use of solar energy for power generation and other uses with the ultimate objective of making solar competitive with fossil-based energy op options. The mission's target is to generate 100 gigawatt 100 gigawatt consisting of 40 gigawatt grid connected rooftop projects and 60 gigawatt of large and medium sized land based solar projects. Total investment envisaged is around 6 lakh crores of rupees. A cumulative 32.5 gigawatt of solar electric generation capacity has been installed by the end of 1920 itself. Now, the National Solar Mission, some facts we should be acquainted with in this direction that uh, the National Solar Mission is an initiative of the Government of India and that of the state governments to promote solar power and the mission is one of the several policies of National Action Plan on Climate Change and the program was inaugurated uh, as the Jamarla Nehru National Solar Mission by former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh uh, in January 2010 with a target of 20 gigawatt by 2022. But this was later increased to 100 gigawatt by the Prime Minister Mr. Narendra Modi in 2015 Union Budget of India. Now, India increased its solar power generation capacity for, by nearly five times from 2650, 2650 a megawatt 
um, on 26 May 2014 to 12,288 uh, megawatt on 31st March 17. And the country added 9,000 megawatts, uh, more than that in 17-18, the highest of any year. The original target of 20 gigawatt was surpassed in 2018 itself, four years ahead of 2022 deadline. Now, National Mission for Enhanced Energy Efficiency. Now, the current initiatives are expected to yield savings of 100 megawatt by 2012, building on the Energy Conservation Act of 2001. The plan recommends mandating specific energy consumption decreases in large energy consuming industries with a system of companies to trade energy savings certificate, energy incentives, including reduced taxes on energy efficient appliances and financing the public-private partnership to reduce energy consumption through demand-side management programs uh, in the municipal buildings and agricultural sector. So it's a great initiative which, uh, which will go a long way you know, in enhanced energy efficiency, in providing enhanced energy efficiency by you know, uh, you know, taxing uh, to a lesser extent to those which are energy efficient uh, products by the companies and industries and uh, also like um, you know uh, supporting in a big way the energy efficient uh, uh, construction structures then the national mission on sustainable habitat and to promote energy efficiency as a core component of urban planning the plan calls for extending the existing energy conservation building code a greater emphasis on urban waste management and recycling including power production from waste strengthening the enforcement of automotive fuel economy standards and using pricing measures to encourage the purchase of efficient vehicles now and incentives for the use of public transportation like the electric scooters now there is a less of uh, less of tax on that right sometimes completely exempted that is one way government can government is promoting uh, energy efficient uh, transport uh, systems then national water mission with water scarcity projected to worsen as a result of climate change, the plan sets a goal of 20% improvement in water use efficiency through pricing and other measures. Steps like mandatory rainwater harvesting, restrictions on drawing groundwater are being taken to prevent further depletion of water resources. Then national mission for sustaining the Himalayan ecosystem. Now the plan aims to conserve biodiversity, forest cover and other ecological values in the Himalayan region the glaciers that are a major source of India's water supply are projected to recede as a result of global warming. The national mission for green India. The goals include the afforestation of 6 million hectares of degraded forest land. It's a vast, you know, this is a whopping objective in fact. 6 million hectares of degraded forest land and expanding forest cover from 23% to 33% of India's territory. This is a great uh, mission that way. And if it really happens, it will do wonders with the ecology. The mission envisages a holistic view of greening and focuses on multiple ecosystem services along with the carbon sequestration and emission reduction. Now, apart from investing in afforestation of degraded forest and non-forest private and public lands, the mission also supports the provision for energy efficient devices to for household purposes. So this is a great mission for Green India that way. Then the National Mission for Sustainable Agriculture. Of course, I have already spoken about it. National Mission on Strategic Knowledge for Climate Change. To gain a better understanding on climate science impacts and challenges, the plan envisions a new climate science research fund, improved climate modeling, and increase international collaboration with that. It also encourages private sector initiatives to develop adaptation and mitigation technologies uh, adaptation means, I mean, changing with the time, changing with the need and the requirement, mitigation to reduce the impact of uh, uh, you know, climate change, uh, such technologies which will reduce the impact on climate change through venture capital fund. The mission has set up you now 11 centers of excellence around 10 state climate change centers across the country. Now, one of India's flagship solar projects, therefore, the giant river solar park powers the New Delhi Metro Railway Station, uh, railway system a network that serves over 2.6 million commuters daily, right. So India's path for fully realizing its renewable energy potential could be a game changer for its own citizens as well as for global efforts to tackle climate change and getting solar projects off the ground is of course no easy task. Solar expansion in India offers key lessons to boost clean energy investments around the world. 
and the Lighthouse Initiative of the World Bank supports the exchange of solar knowledge between Indian agencies and their counterparts in Bangladesh and Maldives and now countries in Africa. Still about 250 million Indians still live without access to electricity, which is why India's path towards fully realizing its renewable energy potential would be a game changer, a great initiative and great achievement for its only citizens certainly as well as for global efforts to tackle climate change and as a guide for other countries as they invest in solar energy. Then of course, National Rural Health Mission, another great mission launched by the government. National Rural Health Mission is a health program for improving healthcare delivery across rural India. The mission initially mooted for seven years, uh, 2005 to 2012 is run by the Ministry of Health. The scheme proposes a number of new mechanisms for healthcare delivery, including training local residents and accredited social health activist Asha, Asha that is accredited social health activist, and uh, uh, the Janani Suraksha Yojana, that is the motherhood protection program. It also aims at improving hygiene and sanitation infrastructure. Noted economists, for example, Ajay Mahal and Vivek Debroy, they call this the most ambitious rural health initiative ever. Now, the total sanitation campaign is another uh, campaign which I discussed before I close for the day. Total sanitation campaign is aimed at ensuring sanitation facilities in rural areas. The, the main goal of total sanitation campaign is to eradicate the practice of open defecation. To give Philip to this endeavor, Government of India has launched Nirmal Gram Puraskar. Communities are facilitated to conduct their own appraisal and analysis to open defecation and take their own action to become open defecation free ODF then community led total sanitation focuses on behavioral changes needed to ensure real and sustainable improvements in the economy. So then uh, I'll briefly talk about uh, the mission for urban planning that Jawaharlal Nehru National Urban Renewal Mission. Now, this JNN URM is a massive city modernization scheme launched by the Ministry of Urban Development. It envisages a total investment of $20 billion over seven years. The scheme was officially inaugurated by the Prime Minister at that time, Dr. Manmohan Singh. Uh, in 2005, it's a program meant to improve the quality of life and infrastructure in cities. And it aims, to creating, aims at creating economically productive, efficient, equitable, and responsive cities by a strategy of upgrading the socio-economic infrastructure in the in these cities. Now, the last but not the least which I am going to discuss is Pura that is providing urban amenities to rural areas. Now, the Pura is a strategy for rural development in India and the concept was given by former president Dr. Abdul Kalam. Pura proposes that urban infrastructure and services be provided in rural hubs to create economic opportunities outside the cities. Physical connectivity by providing roads, electronic connectivity by providing communication network, and knowledge connectivity by establishing professional and technical institutions will have to be done in an integrated way so that economic connectivity will emanate. So the Indian government aims at developing the compact uh, areas around a potential growth center in the Gram Panchayats or a group of Gram Panchayats through public-private partnership. The government has been running pilot Pura Pro programs in several states since 2004. So, students, what I'm saying is that uh, these are the seven great ideas which I have spoken about and talked to you, which will certainly help you. Like, this is a complete coverage of Indian economy. I have made a complete coverage of Indian economy today, and it is going to greatly help all the candidates, right, who are preparing for civil service examination. I have, and I, I prepared this based on my long experience of more than two decades. This is a great presentation on Indian economy. It covers all the aspects and all those wonderful and great ideas which are making Indian economy a highly growth-oriented economy, a resilient economy, and a great you know, marketplace also for the world economy. But Indian economy, by all means, is going to be one of the top economies in coming days and years. And certainly with that hope and with that note, I end this talk and wish you all the very best of success. Remember, my name is Vishwuta Vinna, and in order to join an academy subscriptions, you please use my referral code that is V and 10, that is victory like never before with the first of 10. And you are entitled for that matter for a whole lot of subscriptions and disc subscription discounts once you use this code. So students, uh, for that matter, I wish you all the very best of success in life in general. 
and in exam in particular. And see you again in my next talk. You can follow me up and join me also in my plus courses. You can also watch my um, live classes. Some of the live classes are for free available. Special classes are there. You can, you can come to an academy platform and see my live classes on polity, on economy, on science and technology, on a whole lot of subjects, right? And I had cracked IS examinations several years ago, and I have now been mentoring and coaching IS candidates, and several of my students are in civil service, right? Some of them are in key positions in government. Some of them have risen to the rank of secretaries also. So what I'm saying, students, that based on my experience, I can tell you that you can succeed. The only thing is you have to have a proper strategy and follow the right mentors. And for that purpose, I'm telling you that you join an academy and a whole lot of top educators of the country are now teaching on an academy platform. So once again, I wish you all the very best of success and good luck. Thank you so much.